us, I think, have become accustomed to demonstrations on college and university campuses. I can put that very simply. As long as they are peaceable and non-disruptive, they have become a very part of the fabric of American life. They are a legitimate means of expression. If they become violent and destructive of property or disruptive of the educational process, they can't be tolerated. Do you think that a university, as a university, could take a stand on a political issue? No, I don't. As the players, we were very excited not going in halftime and meeting Coach Landry. I guess you will. Now, will you sit in the stands like uh, most bands do at the Cowboy Games and then come uh, parading down at halftime with anything fancy, or is it just going to be a straight, uh, serious touch football game? Well, we I'm asking uh, most of the players personally, let's sit up in the stands and, uh, and get to know or some of our fans. and. We hope that we can uh, get up in the stands and watch the band as well. Of course, there may be a problem with all the autographs of the kids who's coming in and getting their, their favorite players, but if so, we, we're going to try to anticipate, or we are anticipating now of sitting in the stands. I understand in your uh, contract for the game you're demanding several plays where you throw passes instead of catch them. Is there any truth <laughs> to this rumor? <laughs> Well, I tell you, it's going to be a little different than uh, usually out there during the season. We're going to have uh, all kind of guys, uh, uh, Jethro and all of them, maybe playing quarterback. It was quite a day in Sulphur Springs. The day started in the early afternoon as a long parade wound its way through the downtown section of the city. The theme of the parade was Our American Heritage, and each of the nine floats involved had some part of the history of our country to portray. Leading the parade was the queen herself, Beth Ashcroft. Music for the parade was provided by the Sulphur Springs High School Band and Marching Drill Team. continued and you'd watch the faces of the people and the many school children who were let out early to see the festivities you couldn't help but want to be a part of it all so I went back to one of the young ladies who is one of the many responsible for the success Hopkins County has enjoyed over the years her name is brightness and her owner is Robbie James hey Robbie now what do I do okay first you want to grab go down and grab right. the head with all one right. hand one hand then you want to Pull down and squeeze it. All right. Hey, it works. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, you want to talk to her. She'll kick. Oh, okay. I'm talking, Brightness. Yeah. It's kind of hard to talk and, and think what you're doing here at the same time. But by golly, it does work. Yeah. There you go. How do you get to doing two hands at once? Okay, Brightness. Well, when you get really experienced at it, you start doing it and you, you get it out in a hurry. This is a lot of fun. Thank you, Brightness. You know, on this day of days in Hopkins County, it's people like Brightness here, 55,000 cows in Hopkins County that have made this day what it is and things they've planned for and made a success out of the dairy festival. It seems rather a shame that on this day of days, people like Brightness here should be exiled to the barn while everybody else is having a lot of fun. But you know, it really doesn't seem to bother very much, does it? Jerry Park, Channel 8 News on the move. Hopkins County Dairy Festival, Sulphur Springs.
Okay, brightness, here we go. There you go. Okay, brightness, it's fine. Everything's good. Everything's good, girl, brightness. Yeah. Days later, the Department of Labor, through its newly formed Department for Occupational Safety and Health, has released its findings into an investigation of that fatal explosion. A spokesman for that department, Mr. John K. Barto, the regional administrator, held a news conference today. He cited four violations, including two willful, on the part of Penwalt Food Industries. Electrical spark that set off a dust explosion initially president, Mr. James McWhirter, at his office in Philadelphia. It is alleged by the government that Penwall Corporation knew of the substandard wiring, that they had been warned by their insurance association that the wiring in this building did not meet government standards. This is Jim Mitchell, Channel 8 News on the Move. Most of the mail that moves through the much-discussed U.S. postal system still has to be handled by people, as many as 16 people in cases where zip codes are not used. A skilled mail handler can sort up to 1,300 pieces of mail an hour. But when you consider the number of times one piece of mail must be handled, and you multiply that by the 84 billion pieces of mail Americans posted in 1971, you begin to see why devices such as this were designed. Provided zip codes are on the letters fed into this machine, it and the 18 people who are required to operate it can sort 43,200 pieces of mail per hour. That's about 2,000 letters per hour per machine operator. Much better, but not fast enough even to keep up with the increasing flow of mail in the United States. A possible next step is in production at the Irving Plant of Recognition Equipment Company. Their machine won't work for Fort Worth's problem, but it will help major cities around the world like New York and Paris. Israel Scheinberg is executive vice president and chief operating officer for recognition equipment. The machine is capable of reading characters at a rate of up to 9,000 characters per second. Now suppose that, that I made a mistake in my typewriter and I said JALAS, J-A-L-L-A-S. Could your system take care of that? Depending on the other information available, in, in many cases it can, because we have what we call an address directory, which is able to determine what that uh, those letters could be. That is, if there is no such thing as a five-letter word that is spelled JALUS, or if the zip code, which is also on the envelope, begins with 752, we already can compare and know that that's Dallas. So we can correct for the kinds of mistakes you're describing. How quickly does this go on? What is the rate of progress through the machine? Well, there are, the typical machine transports these uh, letters at a rate of about 200 inches a second through the transport, which means we're transporting uh, envelopes and processing them at a rate of up to, say, 86,000 uh, or more envelopes per hour.
Well, it was very nice, uh, Jerry. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, I was fortunate enough to play well and putt well, and I'm very happy at this time. What did you make the turn in? I started out on the front nine. I had 31, and then I came back in 35. How did you finish up on 18? With a par. I uh, kind of had a shaky par. I hit my second shot in the right-hand bunker, but they had a great bunker shot about an inch or so from the pin. You think a four under will stand up for the rest of the day? Well, it, it's hard to say. Uh, it could, yes. Well, I don't know. I had uh, this golf course. You just, uh, if you make par or anything around par here, par better, you've had a good hole. Uh, a par is never bad on this golf course on any hole, so you can't say uh, any holes are really real good. I, the ninth hole, I had a very bad tee shot, but I managed to get a good second shot in there and made about 18 or 20 footer for birdie, so I'd say that was probably a big key turning point in the round. On the backside, what were your better ones? Uh, Bertie, both the par threes on the back side, and uh, both times I hit a five iron in at uh, 13. I put it in about five feet, and then I hit a seven iron in at 16, about five feet there. That was the only two birdies I made on the back side. Well, it was a little bit different, uh, two separate rounds. Through the first four holes, I was one over par, hadn't hit a green, and I was lucky to be one over. Uh, I birdied the sixth hole and the eighth hole, uh, and then I bogeyed 13, so I was even par after 13. I made a 30-foot putt on... 14, a uh, good shot on the par 3, 16, about 3 foot, and I made a birdie, and then I hold a sand trap shot on 17 for a birdie, and finished with 67, and I was going to be happy with 70, so I'm kind of happy with the 67. Freedom, if the university, qua university, takes a stand on a political issue, then uh, those who dissent from that view, there are, there are threats or there are psychological fears and feelings, I think, that those who dissent from that view are somehow out of favor. And this is only a legitimate viewpoint in the context of complete freedom of individuals to express themselves. One of the ticklish questions that arises is, what is where does that leave the president or the chancellor of a great university? who has very strong views of his own and would like to express them. I think some of the students and others who would like to hear university presidents speak up on these issues might be surprised to know how much we would like to speak up on some of them, you know. By all rights, these kids shouldn't have this much energy. They got on a bus at Baton Rouge, Louisiana this morning at 1.30 and listen to them. They're one of four bands. They're from Southern University in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The other bands are Bishop College, Jackson State, and Grambling College of Louisiana. They're vying for $25,000 in prizes, sponsored by Brenham and Texas Stadium. Brenham is going to be giving $10,000 for a first prize winner tomorrow night in the competition, $7,000 prize and two $4,000 ones. They're great. Take a listen. Action is tomorrow night at Texas Stadium. The big battle of the bands, $25,000 worth. Malcolm Landis at Texas Stadium for Channel 8 News on the move. If there is a basic difference between the people who live here and we who live in the less spectacular but less savage southwestern United States, it is this. The hardships endured by our great-grandparents have been overcome, and in great measure our environment plays no role in who we are or how we behave toward each other. In these mountains, nature never allows one to forget who is master and who is trespasser. Yesterday, when we arrived in Recon, it appeared that except for daily drizzle, the community had the hard months behind for another year. Spring had returned buds to the trees and color to the grass and flowers, but the mountains keep people honest and humble. This morning, the snow began again. I tell you all that so you will understand the people of Recon, Switzerland. There is a special kinship among mountain people everywhere. When nature does her best to drive you away, a friend is invaluable, and the mountain men know that.
1959, the Tibetan followers of the Dalai Lama attempted to throw off the shackles of their Chinese overlords and failed. Some dared the bitter passes of the Himalayas and with their god king escaped to India, Nepal, Sikkim, and Bhutan. But land was expensive there and hard to get. A plea spread through the mountains of Europe for help for these oppressed and dispossessed people. Recon heard that call, promised jobs and homes. October 25th is something of a local holiday, for in the autumn of 1961, 23 Tibetans ended the trip from India to the land given them by the fathers of Recon. 80,000 Tibetans left the Chinese rule. More than 1,000 ended their quest for peace in these alpine valleys. More than 130 Tibetan babies have been born in 11 Swiss Tibetan communities. Most of their fathers and brothers work in factories like this metalworks at Recon. And if the future is as kind to Switzerland as the past has been, then these new generation mountain folk will still be here when their sons are born. They'll still be working hard, holding their own in their battle against winter, and enjoying a freedom few other people in the world will ever know. Jerry Taft, Channel 8 News on the Move at Recon, Switzerland.
one of the thousands of fort worthy ins who sees this structure almost every day and has it stuffed away in the back of your mind is just one of those dirty old buildings down by the railroad tracks you do it great injustice of course you recognize it as the old post office building in fort worth you may even rush in and out of it occasionally but do you know its history it was built in 1931 and 1932 it was dedicated on george washington's birthday in 1933 and it was expected to serve the postal needs of the growing Fort Worth area for the better part of a hundred years. In the old days, mail was something special. When you posted a letter or a document, it was important to you, not likely to be addressed to the occupant, and not likely to be shipped in thousand-unit lots. You know times have changed. I wonder whether you realize just how much. We have something we call interference, or the fact that there are a lot of things on an envelope such as this that don't have anything to do with where the envelope should be going. Another problem which is a, a very important and severe one to handle is the fact that the envelopes vary so much in size from the very small one to the very large. Another problem is that the quality of the printing on the envelope is often quite bad, cases where it's printed on a high-speed line printer by a computer. Uh, another problem that we encounter is that the same address can be written a number of different ways. It can be written in four lines, it can be written in five lines, it can have a zip code on it, or sometimes it won't have a zip code on it. These are problems that we have to handle. The mail is brought to the machine in trays. It has already been put in, uh, set in the proper direction to be fed into the machine on a, on a prior, in a prior operation. It is then placed in the machine in these trays, it is automatically unloaded into the system, and then it is brought forward into a uh, position to be fed, and then it is picked up by a vacuum device which actually lifts up a letter and separates any other letters which might have been lifted up at the same time by means of a vacuum separating device. The mail is then inserted into the transport. First thing that happens in the transport is that we search out and find where the address is located and read that into our uh, system for recognition. Exactly how does it accomplish that? The reading is accomplished by means of a, an eye which is a columnar array of, of photosensitive devices which actually are looking at the face of the envelope uh, and removing this information which is in, uh, in converting it to electrical signals which can be processed by the computing system which does the actual reading. The letter is then uh, given direction to uh, uh, where it needs to be sent by means of a a uh, processing called address processing where we actually take the information that was read from the envelope, compare it to information that we have stored in the system in a computer, which allows us to uh, determine where this letter should be, where its destination uh, is to be.